This is the story of Monsignor James Kerwin. It is a natural human inclination to celebrate heroes and use them as models for the type of person we aspire to be. But often, the passage of time causes many great life stories to slip beneath the pages of history and be forgotten for all time. In making this video, I want to see to it that that time has not yet come for Monsignor James Kerwin. God, through His providence, raises men up for a purpose and for the service of His people. The Lord imbues His servants with strength, faithfulness, and a love for others. Monsignor Kerwin was an example of a man that God appointed to a specific place and point in history, and his life serves as an example to all. James Kerwin was born on July 1, 1872 to Patrick and Mary Kerwin of Circleville, Ohio. And that's where he attended the local Catholic school and then St. Mary's College in Kentucky. And finally, Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio. On June 19th of 1895, he was assigned to the Diocese of Galveston. His assignment to Galveston placed him in a rapidly growing diocese that presented unique challenges. The city of Galveston is situated on a long, low-lying sandbar whose natural harbor made it an attractive location for a settlement. The 19th century had not been kind to Galveston. With its placement on the Gulf Coast, some researchers estimated that as many as 16 major hurricanes had struck the island over the course of 90 years. During the Civil War, the city was the focal point of a battle that saw many of its structures damaged by artillery fire. In 1885, Galveston had suffered a major fire that burned 40 city blocks and hundreds of homes. This fire displaced many residents and forced the city to rebuild. Throughout the 19th century, Galveston's population would grow, making it the largest city in Texas and one of the most important seaports in the country. Galveston was labeled as the Ellis Island of the West. With an increased population in this hot and humid climate, Galveston suffered a series of yellow fever epidemics throughout the 19th century that claimed the lives of thousands of its citizens. Life in Galveston at this time was volatile with the ever-present possibility of disaster. In the later half of the 19th century, Galveston and the rest of Texas was still working to establish institutions and infrastructure that made life more stable and comfortable. The harsh environment of Galveston began to take its toll on the health of Galveston's second bishop, Claude Dubuis. Because of health concerns, Bishop Dubuis would become an absentee bishop and would stay in France where he could receive better medical attention. The Vatican took notice of Bishop Dubuis' absence and appointed Bishop Dufal as coadjutor bishop. However, after receiving a chilly reception from clergy, Bishop Dufal resigned less than a year later, citing health problems. The Vatican replaced Bishop Dufal with Reverend John Mayer as coadjutor bishop to Galveston, but he declined the appointment for medical reasons. The Vatican would then call on 36-year-old rector from Ohio, Bishop Nicholas Gallagher, to be the coadjutor bishop of Galveston. Bishop Gallagher would not receive a warm reception from clergy in the diocese. As many of the French priests retired and returned to France, Bishop Gallagher would recruit priests from Ohio to serve in the diocese. The transition would take 10 years before Bishop Du Bois' death in 1892 and Bishop Gallagher's ascent to being the ordinary bishop. Father Kerwin was one of the priests from Ohio who was in the group that was recruited by Bishop Gallagher. The diocese had been in need of English-speaking priests. Father Kerwin and his cohort would serve this purpose. Upon his arrival in Galveston on August the 15th of 1896, Father Kerwin was installed as rector of St. Mary's Cathedral Parish. Father Kerwin began his ministry and work of responding to disasters the following year when Galveston was struck by yet another yellow fever epidemic where he encouraged citizens of the city to follow sanitation protocols to help curtail the outbreak. He spent many days and nights consoling the sick and dying, uh, deeds which 
would win him the love and admiration of the city. He would build a reputation over time in the city of Galveston through his diligent work. Among his many other talents, Father Kerwin was known to be a gifted orator and would deliver many patriotic speeches. Because of his expressions of patriotism, Father Kerwin became involved with the formation of the first U.S. Volunteer Infantry when the Spanish-American War broke out. The men of the unit respected Father Kerwin and asked him to be the chaplain for them. The Department of Defense would endorse this by making Father Kerwin a captain in the United States Army. After two years of service, Father Kerwin received a full honorable discharge from the military and resumed his post as the rector of St. Mary's Cathedral. In the 1890s, the city of Galveston was a place reeling from a string of disasters, and the diocese was also working through adversity with administrative disharmony. But none of the hurricanes, yellow fever epidemics, uh, ministerial strife, fires, artillery barrages, and the day-to-day -day living challenges would compare to what was about to befall the city of Galveston. The Lord raises men up with his loving kindness to go out into the world and administer his mercy. His servants are given gifts and then put in places to give those gifts. Father Kerwin's spiritual formation would be put to the ultimate test just four years after his appointment as rector. All of his graces and gifts would be brought to bear in what would become one of North America's worst disasters. The Gulf of Mexico with its warm waters have always been a fertile region for devastating hurricanes. On September the 8th of 1900, Galveston would be struck by a hurricane that would alter the course of its history forever. The people of Galveston had little or no warning of its impending doom. By the time the storm was done pushing on shore, creating a 12-foot storm surge and making a northeastern turn, estimates put the death toll between 6,000 and 12,000 people. 7,000 structures on the island were completely demolished and 10,000 people became homeless, with all other structures incurring some sort of damage. Gathering in several feet of flood water, Father Kerwin and 14 other citizens led by Colonel J.H. Hawley would compose a public safety committee to mount a response to the devastation. Father Kerwin, Mayor Walter Jones, and Police Chief Edward Ketchum made up a triumvirate that would exercise absolute power on the island. Father Kerwin wrote the order placing Galveston under martial law to curtail looters and vandals. He also set up the Central Relief Committee for feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and conducting search and rescue. He also oversaw the horrible task of burying the dead. Father Kerwin, along with a local rabbi, would serve as an armed guard uh, for relief supplies that were being brought into the Ursuline Academy, which was being used as a shelter and hospital in the aftermath of the storm. Father Kerwin was said to be everywhere at once, providing aid and consoling the suffering. Following the storm, Father Kerwin would demonstrate his bravery in a series of incidents that would further cement his legend among the people of Galveston. One morning in 1901, Father Kerwin awoke to the sound of sirens and bells, only to discover that the city was engulfed in flames. Entire city blocks were being destroyed by an out-of-control blaze. Like before during the hurricane, Father Kerwin sprung into action by rushing into burning buildings to rescue people trapped inside. This heroic act left him with lifelong eye damage. After the fire, Father Kerwin lobbied for and obtained funding to upgrade Galveston's water system and equipment for the fire department. For his heroism and support for funding equipment, the Galveston Fire Department would honor Father Kerwin with a gold medal. In 1907, he risked his life in order to mediate an end to the Southern Pacific Dock Workers Strike where tensions were dangerously high. Years later, he would put his life on the line again. This time, Galveston Police Chief Perrette would seek Father Kerwin's assistance in the diffusing of a near riot caused by a barroom altercation. Fearing direct police intervention would unnecessarily escalate the situation, 
Father Kerwin intervened by walking into a saloon by himself to talk down the belligerent parties. Much to everyone's relief, his aptitude for diplomacy paid off once again. Perhaps Father Kerwin's most courageous act was his very public condemnation of the Ku Klux Klan and courageous public rhetoric aimed at undermining the operation of the political terror group. At a public event sponsored by the Klan at the corner of Maine and McKinney in Houston, Father Kerwin refused to salute the American flag in the presence of the Klan. That flag, Father Kerwin said, has a dirty spot on it. The Klan would threaten to kill Father Kerwin. For a time, the Knights of Columbus formed a guard that accompanied him on his travels to and from Galveston in order to thwart any assassination attempt. Father Kerwin's intellectual acumen was reflected in the various appointments he held. In 1911, Bishop Gallagher appointed Father Kerwin president of St. Mary's Seminary. Under his leadership, the seminary became financially self-supporting. In addition to his administrative role, he would also teach classes in theology, scripture, Latin, Spanish, and catechism. In December of the same year, Father Kerwin would be appointed vicar general and serve as Bishop Gallagher's assistant. In 1915, Father Kerwin joined Joseph Pershing's campaign in Mexico and served as chaplain. Father Kerwin was awarded another commission to join General Pershing in America's entry into World War I. On the way to Washington, Father Kerwin would learn of Bishop Gallagher's death and was forced to return to Galveston to run the diocese until a replacement for Bishop Gallagher was named. Despite calls by many for Father Kerwin to be appointed bishop, it was not to be. Speculation holds that during the recovery effort following the hurricane, Father Kerwin prudently authorized the burning of bodies in an effort to stave off disease. Regardless of his reasoning, this act was frowned upon by the church leadership and would be a black mark against his name. The Vatican would appoint Father Christopher Byrne instead. During his ministry in Galveston, Father Kerwin would earn the love and respect of other clergy, including the Jewish community. On June 24, 1922, Pope Pius XI would award him with the honorific title of Monsignor in recognition of his many contributions to the church, his country, and the city of Galveston. As is the fate that befalls all men, Monsignor Kerwin's health began to fail in the summer of 1925, and he was diagnosed with high blood pressure. He celebrated his last mass on Sunday, January the 24th, 1926. After Sunday dinner, it was his routine to take an afternoon nap. This afternoon nap would be the beginning of his eternal rest. Following funeral services, Monsignor Kerwin's body would be taken to Circleville, Ohio for final burial. When reflecting on Father Kerwin's life, I see a man who is intensely devoted to Christ Jesus. I see a man that was gifted with many talents from God. I also see a man that was always looking for his next opportunity to be obedient. Whether it was responding to the suffering of people dying of disease, mediating a fight, uh, running the cathedral, or teaching a Latin class, Father Kerwin was always eager and energetic to fulfill the mission of the church in life. It is my prayer that God would give me the vision and fortitude to emulate Father Kerwin in my own life and continue the cause of the great commission that Christ has called us to.